And as a child, you carry a lot of uncertainty of, was it me? Was it my fault? Mm. Was I not good enough? There's more women wanting to act than men, yeah. but there's more male part. And then obviously like my dad died in a fairly tragic way. And there was a lot of like um, uh, things to unpack with my childhood, with him as well, and all, and all of that that was going on, because uh, he was an alcoholic. And there is still a class system in the UK where people look at you at how you speak. You know, you can tell your, your class by your accent. And that also shut some doors at different levels, you know? It's your writing. No one just says to you, to, like to your face, like yeah. what you are, we don't need it. Oh, then if I did go for an audition, well, why didn't you get it? You know, I'd, well, because my hair's curly, because my surname is Giorgio. I don't know. I'm shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly, but it does then make you think, oh, well, maybe I am shit. Changing Tides. Mm -hmm. So the short film that you wrote, you directed, and I, as I understand, it's a very, very personal story for you. Yes. That's the, that's the struggle, and that's what I want this story to show, is as a person that cares for someone with an addiction, it's that roller coaster of emotions that you go on. It's not a commentary on how people become addicted. It's a commentary on the lives of an addict. He was just a flawed man. He was mm. just a very troubled, depressed man. Find out what's happening in the industry. You need to, if you really want to be in it, you need to be in it. I'm Andrea Rogozin, and this is Beyond Real Talk, a podcast where I invite real entertainment industry professionals and ask them real questions. What are they actually doing? Why are they doing it? How are they doing it? And how can you start doing the same thing in my today's guest is an actress, writer, director. You might have seen her in Casualty, Coronation Street, Holby City, and The Inside Man, where we met, Catherine Georgia. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> how are you? Well, it was correct? <laughs> it was all correct, yes. Um, and you pronounced it correctly as well, Georgia. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> all right. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's basically right now, it's almost like my round. I'm doing the round of, uh, you know, episodes with people, people from the inside, man. Mm -hmm. uh, and thank you for, for inviting me into your lovely home. Usually I start uh, with how was your childhood, mm -hmm. you know, and what pushed you towards this? <laughs> right, yeah, this uncertain industry. I mean, yeah, because yeah. like, who, when, when did you decide that, you know what, I need more rejection in my life? <laughs> yeah, and it's funny because I keep choosing diff like career paths recently with even more rejection, like writing and directing, and there we go. Um, so I, um, I'm from a very working class family uh, on the outskirts of Blackpool. Um, no one in my immediate family did anything to do with the arts. Mm. Um, my dad was a fantastic storyteller, uh, but he didn't really do anything to do with the arts. So me and him used to make up stories together um, when I was very little. And then I was always nagging my mom that I wanted to go to drama school. So, uh, not drama school, drama club. I didn't mm. even know what drama school was. What, what, like, why did you decide that you want to do it? Um, well, so, we always had a dressing up box at home. So, mum would like go to, um, being from Blackpool, we've got a lot of joke shops and um, and obviously lots of charity shops. So mum would go there and uh, so she'd get wigs from the joke shops and she'd get outfits from the charity shops and we'd have this big box that we used to dress up in. And I used to nag my two sisters, I'm the youngest of three, to death so we could go out and play. They were happy to, but I really loved it. And I loved this dress up. I love make-believe, I love stories. And so I really wanted to get into a drama club, but we didn't have any in our area at the time. And then this girl started at my primary school um, and her mum did a drama club at the YMCA in St. Anne's. So me and her became best friends and it was just like really like fortuitous that her mum also did this drama class, mm. um, Marion Campbell. And I, I gave her a part in my first short film as well. Nice. Um, so she was my first ever drama teacher and I just loved it. I loved making things up. I loved the improvisation of it. Um, I got my first stage appearance when I was... I think I was seven or eight and I had to walk up through all of the audience uh, ad-libbing about a, um, a dog biting my bum as a postman and I loved it. And then from then I'd really got the bug. Um, and then when I went to the theatre uh, with that drama group, I'm just seeing things and just, I was so mesmerised and just being, I want, I want that, I want to do that. Um, yeah, so that, I guess that was it, really. All right. And uh, where, where did you go to study? After I left um, secondary school, I went and did a BTEC in performing arts at Blackpool and Fowl College. 
um, because I didn't want to do A-levels. Much to my career's advisor's dismay, she was uh, telling my mum that I'm, I should do A-levels, I should do A-levels, I've got the results for it, and I just didn't want to. I, don't, I, I just wanted to act. I didn't want to do anything else, so it was a mm. point. And thankfully, my mum was very um, supportive of that. So I did that for two years, and then from there, or whilst I was there, then I started to learn about drama schools. I started to learn that it was possible that I could go Possibly. It's just a minute chance that I could maybe go to these drama schools I'd heard of in London. Um, so then I started auditioning for drama schools and um, also for universities as well that did acting. Um, I came down to London and um, went to an audition at Mount View, which mm. used to be just down the road, hence why I've never moved out of the area. Uh, but now it's in Peckham. And um, I just loved it. I loved the feeling of the place I love the attitude of the place um yeah so then I auditioned for that I what well, well, can, can you tell me a little bit more about the process of auditioning for for drums yeah. yeah yeah okay so I mean not to me but I know everything yeah <laughs> as I always say in my podcast, yeah but to the listeners well so this was about a thousand years ago so it might have changed <laughs> might have changed a bit right now but um so you pay actually central has just done away with this now which is good but you normally have to pay per school to audition mm. um and then you have to travel overnight to get there and various different schools have different ways of doing it so i'm not going to name and shame any of the schools but there was some who were very you know you get you get 10 minutes in a room you have to do a monologue a song uh and then that's it buzzer you're out or it was back in that time um and but mount view on the other hand was a whole day workshop And it was, uh, so you really got, and I think some, there was something wrong with my train, so I missed part of it. And then they let me stay behind and, and showed me around and did more things. And so they really took an invested interest in me. Um, but yeah, some of, the, some of the drama schools were quite brutal. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the drama schools back then, they don't do this anymore now, but they stripped you of your accent as well. And everybody would then have to talk RP like that the whole time, that they were there for the three years. I've heard about that, yeah. Yeah, whereas Mount View is very much, uh, RP is an accent, uh, which is another reason why I liked it. Mm -hmm. Um, Which is, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is kind of more of the path that in general the industry is taking right now. Yeah. Because the industry wants authentic, proper accents and then no, not like strip everyone, you know, of anything that you are. And yeah. then, yeah. Uh, absolutely. And that's the way it should be. But it, it wasn't at the time when I went. It was very much... Um, There was this suggestion that you need to be a blank, a hundred percent blank canvas, mm. so you can be anyone, mm. um, not tap into who you already are, where, where it's flipped now. And I don't know, maybe in a few years it'll go somewhere in between the two. Who knows? Who knows? Um, but yeah, so drama school can be quite brutal because there's hundreds and hundreds of people going for the parts. Mm. Um, and then ultimately it's about 30 people that get a place in the end. I, and I mean, it's often actually, it's happened thousands that go for it. So in my year as well at Mount View was the first time that they'd done a parity, uh, equal parity on male and female mm. of 50% each. Whereas every other year, it'd always been more males because- Oh, really? Well, because there's male, male parts. Interesting, because like, I'm, I'm, <laughs> from what I know right now, like from what I've heard right now, I'm not 100% sure that it's true, but like, and even from my experience, very often like the classes that I take, that the, you know, the courses that I take, there is more, Uh, women than men. 100%. No, there's more There's more women wanting to act than men, yeah. but there's more male parts. So yeah. in the professional drama schools, they mm -hmm. would take more men because obviously they are also marked, every university in the, in the world is um, marked on a graduation success rate. Okay, yeah. So obviously if there's more male parts, then you're going to have more male men. Doing, who are successful. Who are, who are going to be successful, which then helps our quota, which then helps our funding, which then Interesting. helps Interesting. I've know. worked in higher education also for 15 years, so I now know all of this part of it as well. Um, but yeah, so, so it was really hard to get in. The first year I got in, but I kind of, I think I was just so desperate to get a place that I said I could have gone without a scholarship, which was a complete lie. I absolutely couldn't have gone without a scholarship because even back then it was 30 grand a year. Um, 
And there's absolutely no way that my family... I mean, I moved down from Blackpool on a mega bus mm-hmm. because we couldn't even afford the petrol. Mm-hmm. So it was like, there's no way you could have afforded to go. To so I'm guessing you didn't take too much of your own stuff with you. No, <laughs> no. Me and my mom would have sort of suitcases. Um, and then uh, I always have this vision of us waiting when we were at Victoria Coach Station. And um, there was one point where we had three cases. So she'd take one or I'd take one up, have to leave it up there, run down, get another oh. one, take it up, and then one would take the last one up. Yeah, like, yeah. And um, so then I, I then I decided, right, I'm going to take a year out. I was distraught, obviously. Mm. I found out the day that I was doing my driving test and I was just like, I just didn't care. Just It was telling me to do stuff. I was like, what? And I just didn't care. <laughs> I failed. Uh, the driving test as well. And then, um, <laughs> so then I took a year out, uh, traveled for a bit, and then and applied again. And mm-hmm. this time put down that I um, I have to have the scholarship. But I had backup plans then if I wasn't going to get in. I wasn't going to take more years out. Mm-hmm. Then I would have gone to um, universities and whatnot. But I did. I was one of the very few people who got um, a full scholarship to go, nice. which was great. Yeah. Uh, so, um, but the only problem with that was I was one of also one of the only other people who had to work a lot on top of it. So when you're at drama school, it's quite different to uni. You know, uni, you're there like 15 hours a week or something ridiculous. Like We're there 40 hours a week. And I started to work 27 hours a week just to pay rent in London. Yeah. No one's residence or anything like that. But it was great fun. I'd go back tomorrow. I loved it. <laughs> I believe you. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm still friends. Most A lot of people from driver school aren't friends with the people they went to drama mm-hmm. school with. The majority of us from our year still are. Yeah. Um, in fact, we were with a load of them just the other night. So, nice. Yeah. Do you know the percentage of people who were with you, like in drama school? First of all, how many people uh, from from your group actually finished it in the end? Um, twenty eight finished out of the thirty, so only okay. two two dropouts. Nice. Um, oh, actually, that's a lie. Twenty seven, but one left and went to RADA in first year. Mm-hmm. Um, one left of his own accord, and I think I don't know. One either dropped out or. One and, and how many of them, like, what would the percentage, approximate the percentage of people who are actually still are in the industry and Ooh, are working? It's probably quite low now because we left a long time ago yeah. as well. You've got to bear in mind. And I even took many years out as well. Mm. Um, but I think it's, it's, yeah, it's probably quite low from our year. Um, but from the adjacent, um, uh, what do you call a musical theatre year? Most of them are in the West End and stuff now. Yeah, yeah but we were we were the actors. We were the, the smoky, smelly, drinky actors. Um, <laughs> Artists. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, but I, but for me personally, because I did take many years out and, um, and then became quite successful in business. And I actually think that working, that going to drama school, learning the arts, learning the art of storytelling, mm. I just think it's useful for so many different facets of business Mm -hmm. so i don't know when it's like are they still in the acting industry no but are they still being successful using it every Mm -hmm. day i'd say yeah Mm, nice nice uh so and you said you you took a pause like so what happened next like did you find an agent straight away or like how how no i didn't i didn't find an agent straight away um and i got a couple of bit parts you said about holby city and i got Mm waiting for the dad Mm -hmm. first Thing was being drowned in the bath first mm. on TV. Um, and then um, I, so then I got, yeah, so then I got an agent a bit a- afterwards, a bit later. I didn't get one straight from drama school. Um, and I was still getting a few bits and pieces here and there, some bits of theatre mm. and things, which was good. And then um, my dad died mm. and I uh, just couldn't, <laughs> basically just couldn't for a while. Um it was, you know, as you well know, this is a, a profession where you are judged on you. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I, I thought just, <laughs> just recently, I thought about that because like when, even when someone says like, you know, all artists are like that, they get getting rejected a lot. But that's the thing, like when you're a writer, for example, like your writing gets rejected, not personally you. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, obviously it's coming from you, but it's your writing. No one just says to you, in, to, like to your face, like yeah. what you are. We don't need it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and, like, and I'd had, like, through drama school and after drama school, all that period, when it was still very much you should be a blank canvas. Mm-hmm. And my surname, no one knows how to say it. No one thinks that you're foreign, you should change it. Mm-hmm. 
And I was, and maybe I should have, maybe I got further if I did, but I was, you know, like, no, that's who I am. And surely I shouldn't have to change my surname to get a job. I got things like, um, your hair isn't fashionable. My agent even told me that, which was hilarious. Um, you know, there's, you, you should probably change your hair. Um, at drama school, they used to say, um, you look like Pride and Prejudice, but you sound like Shameless. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, so then there's all of these things. And when you're getting that and then all the rejection, and then it's also like the family who mean well, they really mean well, but they don't understand the world. And it's not like when you're going for a corporate job or any other job where you get an interview and if you haven't got four interviews and you maybe need to readdress what you're doing, if you haven't got four acting jobs, you, that's fine. You're nowhere near it. Whereas it's like people who aren't in this profession don't get that. Mm-hmm. So then, so I was already feeling a bit insecure about myself and then having like family members continually ask me, well, when are you going to get an audition? When are you going to... Like, well, it's I, not like I can't get an edition. Like, it's not like I'm taking them out of the thin air. Like, I'm not creating an Exactly that. Exactly that. And so, and it wasn't really always understood. Or oh, then if I did go for an audition, well, why didn't you get it? You know, I, but because my hair's curly. Because my surname's Giorgio. I don't know. I'm shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But it does then make you think, yeah. oh, God, well, maybe I am shit, actually. Maybe I am. And then... And then obviously, like, my dad died in a fairly tragic way. And there was a lot of, like, um, uh, things to unpack with my childhood with him as well and all, and all of that that was going on because uh, he was an alcoholic and that's what killed him. Um, and and then as a as an adult child of an alcoholic as well, and you're also then left with lots of other questions of family members and things to process yourself, all of these things. And then once you're getting all of that, Plus all of this rejection, plus all of these other people not understanding. I was like, I just, I can't do it. I just don't have the mental strength. And um, so then I took many years out, basically. Mm. And what did you do? Uh, so I started working in, uh, I've been temping in between acting jobs at various universities. It tends to just be, I, I don't know why, it just tended to be universities. Mm. Um, and uh, then I was offered to do to go for an interview. Oh, I was so reluctant to go for an interview for a full-time job. And I was like, oh, cause that's like me then. <laughs> that's me saying, okay, yeah, I'm not good enough. I'm not, and I'm not going to do it anymore. Anyway, I went for it, got the part, got the job, sorry. And, um, and then I thought, okay, so maybe this is the universe telling me that I am right to take a break and just do this. Plus I was so bored of not getting paid anything. Mm. <laughs> just need some money. So I did that, worked at a university at London Met, ended up being there for seven years, I think. Um, started off, as I said, as a temp, did um, like corporate engagement stuff, then was like um, manager of admin in one of the faculties. And then, um, but as part of that remit, I did like loads of things. So I did timetabling and finance and all sorts of stuff. And then from that, uh, went to LBS, someone that I, uh, London Business School, mm-hmm. Someone that I'd worked with at London Met kind of poached me, sent me a little message going, oh, there's a job for you. Uh, so I went over there, did all the timetable and stuff there, and then got promoted to project director, then director of engagement and innovation. And then my latest job title there was uh, innovation portfolio director. Nice. I left. Yeah. 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 So, um, and I left there just a short of, just over 12 months ago. How you decided that you want to get back into, into this? So... I was at LBS at the time um, and I was transitioning uh, from the senior manager role in academic planning to uh, project director. Um, and I'd, uh, they put me on this course in their executive education program, which was amazing. That I got this for free. Like mm-hmm. these courses are like 50 grand. Uh, but I won a ballot to go into it and it was essentials of leadership. And I was like, God, they're really investing in me. So I was at this point like, you know, they're, they're wanting to promote me. They're investing in me. They see me as a future in the career. So maybe that's where I should go. Then on the very last day we had, so it was like uh, on that program, there was 55 countries represented. And um, on the last or the penultimate day, we all went for dinner and, and uh, drinks together. And it was at the arts club. Uh, you know, the theatre bar. No, I'm not, I'm the one that Jim sure. loves with the karaoke. Anyway, uh, what you saying? Phoenix Arts Bar. Yeah yeah, 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 of course. I remember we, we had the, the, the screening screening for season two there for yeah. the Inside Man. For the yes. Inside Man, exactly this. <laughs> so, so we'd had uh, some dinner, they'd hide it out of the back. We'd had a dinner together, and then it was the open mic night that Jim always loves to go to. 
So some of us stayed to listen because the singers are fantastic there. Um, I ended up sitting on a table. So this was at the, bear in mind, I'm just about to graduate from this. It was, it was like a week long, two week long course or something. But I'm just about to graduate from that. And, uh, and then I sit at this table with Jim and me and Jim just crack each other up all night, really making each other laugh. And he's like, I'm just about to start casting for a series. Mm-hmm. And um, there's a comedy character and I really want you to come on audition. And so I did, and then that's how I got the part. So, so basically, the Inside Man and Jim Shields, that's what brought you back to acting. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. And so, and so, but then the thing was, though, is that even then, for like the first sort of two series, yeah, the first two series, I was still unsure. I was like, mm-hmm. is like, I don't realize, maybe, maybe I'll just do, use my annual leave and just do that mm-hmm. as, you know. But then we had COVID, and then COVID hit, and COVID was crazy. Um, and I was working, I, oh my gosh, such insane hours. I can't even tell you in a condensed studio flat. And, um, oh, COVID, honestly, COVID, COVID broke me. Yes. Uh, like very, very strongly because first of all, I remember like after season two, I remember Jim Shields saying like, oh, you know, we want to bring you for season three, but then COVID season three is much smaller. Like there's less parts and et cetera. But also it's just like, I was, I was working as a designer from home, mm-hmm. I'm renting a room, yeah. and this room is just my working station, where I sleep, where I eat, where I rest, it's just like a prison cell. I got, I gained so much weight, I stopped yeah. exercising, I got depressed, I didn't know I was depressed, then I realized I was depressed, and like, oh, well, there's too late to do something with that, and it's just like, right now, I'm still, I'm still in a place like, I'm not over COVID, I need to get back to my older self, because I'm not, I don't feel comfortable as a person <laughs> yeah right well this and this, i think that was the same with me so it was like i was working thank god i had this wonderful team of me and three other ladies who were like my sanctuary whilst everybody else was being torrid like it was honest to god you, some of the people some of the students were like acting as if it, like we'd created this it was like our fault you know it was like people were being quite mean and so um So I was working, I only had 10 days off on that year of the first year of COVID. Um, And I was working sometimes on a Saturday, sometimes 12 hour days. It was nuts. Um, And then, and so I I knew in my heart that I still sort of wanted to do the acting. And um, it never ends. No, no, exactly. And then I had a coach. So I got a coach, uh, a career coach. And that was my first question to her was like, I don't know if I should, because because of COVID, the business school had seen even more what I could do. And so then they were like, oh, we need to promote her even more. Like, mm-hmm. She's very capable. Mm-hmm. But I'm still like, I just want to do that over there <laughs> um, a little bit. So then I, so I said to, to the coach, that was a question. So we worked through all these things. We did it for four weeks, I think. And she was like, I've never met anybody who wants to be more creative. She went, I think you know your answer. And so then from that, then on the January of the following year, then I plowed myself into doing the 21 day self tape challenge, mm. um, loads of the online casting director courses, uh, casting acting classes, well being stuff, loads of mental health things to try and get my confidence back to act. Because if it, it's so deep rooted that I wanted to do it, but I didn't think I was capable of mm-hmm. doing other things. Um, so that's what I did. And then just went nuts. <laughs> <laughs> We're absolutely nuts. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm, I'm one of these per- people who like, if I'm going to do it, I fully immerse. Um, so I did that using all of my spec because, because obviously, because COVID too, I couldn't go out or see anyone. Mm-hmm. So then, as soon as uh, work finished, I'd be doing acting things. Um, yeah, and then it just realized that like that's just yeah taking over. What about the agent? Uh, like, are you back with the same agent, or are you find no? Out? I'm with a different agent. So I had a um, kind of. So I left that agent when I decided this because um, she was lovely. She was great. We'd been together for many years, but it was time to leave. I think sometimes also when you've, I hadn't had castings for a while and, you know, just it was just time for both of us. So we left very, very amicably. Yeah. Uh, and then um, I, the, my current agent that I've got now, I actually did, going full pelt on everything, um, I did a class with, um, do you know Ronatic Shouting? No. They're really good, really supportive. Um, and I did a six week class uh, with Philip Ridley uh, scripts. And it was Philip Ridley, if you don't know, he's a bit like the living pinter. He's like this insanely amazing. I've got all of his plays. Um, and he wrote the this special monologue to be taught in this class over six weeks. Um, 
but we were all embargoed from sharing it or anything. Anyway, weeks, months later, um, they run it shouting and putting on a show, which was one of his um, one man shows. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it, they'd selected some of the students who'd done the various classes of Phillips to him to write monologues for them. And we performed them at the end of this special night. Uh, so after we filmed season five of The Inside Man, mm -hmm. uh, seven days later, I did that monologue. Um, mine was like eight minutes long. And <laughs> yeah, I loved it. And then and my agent was in the audience and that how I, that's how I got her. So I've only been with her for like a year and a half. Yeah, how was it going? Yeah, I just think she's great. Really, really like her, really, um, yeah. I feel like we work well as a team, which is so important. I've been with another agent in between that period. Um, and uh, it felt like, like it should be a business partnership. And it didn't feel like that. Like this is ultimately my career that we work together on, you know. Um, and I think that sometimes where um, if you pick the wrong agent, it doesn't work in that way. So, yeah, me and her work really, really well together. I think she's great. Um, and I'm... I don't know. I've got this feeling in my stomach that something good is coming. I just oh, don't know yeah. what. <laughs> and when. Yeah, and when. But I don't know. I'm just like, it's crazy to say it, isn't it? But I've just got this feeling that it's yeah. all going to be, be good. You When have you decided that you want to write? And how you learn to write? And Yeah. You know. So, well, that's an interesting one as well. I, I, nothing, as you've probably noticed from this chat, nothing goes linear for me. Mm -hmm. I just do this for a while before I figure out what the bloody hell I'm doing. Um, so when I was at London Met in um, one of the jobs that I had there, uh, they were just about to... So the first permanent job I had, the one that I was a bit reluctant about going mm -hmm. for at first, what they used to do at the time is because it was an old polytechnic university, which we now call post-92 universities. Um, and what that means is they're this new breed of universities and they're very much aimed at uh, the first family member going to uni. That's like sort of their USP, if you will. Um, Which, uh, as I understand, is like more for kind of working class. Working class, yeah, exactly. And so what then they used to do as well then is all staff, permanent staff, could get a uh, qualification that was higher than the last one that they had for free. Mm. Like, I am sorry, what? I mean, if there's a, I'm proper working class, there's something free, I am taking it. Of course. Uh, so I was at the business school and the dean was just leaving. I was also a bit crafty maybe, but he was leaving and um, I used to do bid writing and proposal writing at that time for research projects. Um, and so I said to him, so I had a degree because I went to drama school, uh, and I said to him, um, I want to do an MA mm -hmm. in creative writing. Uh, and I had to write a business case about what, you know, um, how would it benefit my role? And I was like, you know, well, I do, I do research, I do bid proposals, I do this. So if I could write creatively, and I could film it, it was just like, oh, whatever. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I think because we got on quite well, it helped. So I, I did uh, an MA in creative writing in 2000 and I think I graduated in 2012 or 2000, no, 2013, I think. Yeah. Um, and I did it in 18 months because I was doing it on top of a full-time job, on top of a theatre company that I had with my best friend. Mm. So I was already doing that as well. On to yeah. So I forgot about the Cat's Whiskers part. So even when I wasn't acting, I had a theatre company, mm -hmm. the children's theatre and entertainment company. Um, and so um, most people, when they do an MA in creative writing, they start with an idea of a novel. And by the time they finish, they've come out with a novel. That's what most people do but I'm not most people so I was like I'm here to learn so I did every module I did something different yeah uh, so I've written poetry and spoken word poetry all my life um, I've been writing plays for a couple of years with Katie my best friend as Cat's Whiskers mm -hmm. for uh, children's audiences and we've been performing them at music with all the big music festivals and Edinburgh and stuff like that And um, so I did playwriting, I did documentary writing, and I did screenwriting, and I did something else, I can't remember. Um, so I did that, but then I'd never really done anything with it. Mm -hmm. But it was always still sort of, you know, there. Somewhere there, Somewhere yeah. there, yeah. And then, and then when COVID happened, and I then, and I was, then became director of engagement and innovation, as opposed to project director, because I would say, well, you can't set, look, think about the narrative of this. What about the structure, you know, using all my storytelling skills on this? Um, 
And then, um, and like we would write, we would work together on crafting a lot of the comms that would go out for all of that. And those wonderful women that I work with. Um, and so then I think it was just like a natural thing and I'm to, to do it. And I don't know, I'm one of these people who just suddenly have like, I have to do it. <laughs> it just suddenly comes out. I know, I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, like it's been formulating in there for ages, but it just comes out. I'm not one of these people who can plan a writing thing a lot. Mm -hmm. It just, it's, it's somewhere um, bubbling away for a while and then it comes out. Let's, let's talk about it. Before we jump to you being a director and before we jump to, to the short film that you wrote and directed, let's talk a little, like a little bit about your process. How do you write? Because uh, I know there are like the writers who actually, like especially for longer stories, they plan everything. They yeah. kind of plan every, every scene, every turning point, everything. And then they kind of start writing. When I uh, wrote something, and, like I don't have a lot of experience with writing, but I did I did write some stuff long time ago when I was 22. I was writing this fantasy short stories, which were not bad because I, I kind of wrote for some um, writing contests, like, and I kind of I I got some good good feedback. But it was like back long long time ago, like I was writing in Russian. Then uh, a couple of years ago, I tried to write something in English, which obviously is harder for me because it's not my native language. But in the end, it never got anywhere. Uh, I do have like a script for a feature film right now, like that could be like the cheapest feature film that you could film because it's just two people in an elevator. For, uh -huh. for an hour and then two scenes, one before and one after, that's it. Uh, but basically how I write, like I just have the idea. Yeah. Maybe not even the idea for the whole thing, but I have this scene, I have a conversation, I have a few lines between two people and I'm like, why they say this these lines? And then like, yeah, I have the scene, I kind of think about it more and more and more and I see how the whole, like the, the, the whole dialogue there and what it's about. And then I started thinking, like, how did we get there? And then I have, like, another scene that's, like, somewhere there. It's, like, in the beginning, you know. And then in the end. And then I have, like, these few scenes, but I don't have, like, a whole story. And what I start writing, like, but the, I start writing only when I'm, like, you know what? I can't. I just have to do it right now because otherwise I, I can't do it. And then I kind of try to connect all the, all, all the dots. Mm -hmm. uh, what, how, how is it for you? First thing I want to say is just because you didn't get anywhere doesn't mean you should stop. <laughs> Right. right? <laughs> Carry on and just keep going. Yeah. Um, uh, so with me, it's very more, I don't think I have a, a lot of people, because I read a lot, uh, I listen to loads of podcasts, I listen to, yeah, as I say, I like to fully immerse, um, because I always think that you learn most from bits of others. I don't follow a whole path of someone. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I don't, every time I write, it's different. So the last two shorts that I've written, <laughs> I, much to my boyfriend's dismay on the last one, because he was living there, living here at the time. Um, I woke up at four o'clock and I, I have to write this now. It's got, not, it's just formed in my sleep. And, but it's, but I've been thinking about it for months, probably, you know, so in, so probably all the people, you know, when everyone does all the like beat sheets and the things and that, I'm, I'm doing that in my head while I'm walking. Yeah. Um, and then, but yeah, there is a, a bit of a knack of me getting up at 4.30 and just having to get it out, just spit it out of me the first time. And obviously the first draft, you can have to change a million times. Um, and, but it tends to be like you, that it's, it's like this overwhelming, I have to do it now. There was even a time when I was on my walk and um, I was doing some exercise or something. I had to go to a shop and buy a notepad and pen. <laughs> oh, it's come. <laughs> Can you <get> <laughs> like, um, so it's quite like that. But I, like, I'm also writing a play at the moment that I'm trying to be more structured with. And, and I'm struggling with it more because of that, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. I don't know. It's, I'm a bit, it's a bit useless, isn't it? I can't really like, I don't, I, I think the first thing is get it out of you. Mm -hmm and then put a structure on top of it you know I, I would say like get um but also yeah I already kind of know how I want it to because I've been thinking about it for so much that I kind of know what the arcs are going to be and what and I've questioned myself but why would they do that and is that how but what would that be and whilst I'm walking you know so then I suppose then the first draft is already is already in a shape and then you can just go back on it again i think they've got to live rent free in your brain basically that's that's the way <laughs> that's the way that i would say that you need to do it um and then just be 
leave it for a few days, leave it for a week even or, or longer and then come back and then look at it like, like periscope up, you know, you're not, it's not, don't be personal about mm. it. It's now a story. Ah, uh, that's the thing like this for me, like, I don't know about you, but for me, that's the thing. Like, it's very hard. Not, first of all, how, what, what do you mean? Like not to get to personal, but like, that's the thing I created. Of course it's personal, but then yeah, like for me, I need, to, I need some time like just not to look at it at all, yeah. just even forget about it, like for, forget most of it. Then when I read, then I kind of like, I can feel like, oh, actually it was good. And they're like, that's stupid. I need to change that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. I think the uh, distance and time gives you perspective. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I think it's like, you know, it's the old adage, isn't it? Like if you're angry, pen them a note, but never send it. You know, oh, it's yeah. that kind of, <laughs> don't put anyone in the address line, but it's, like, and then you go back and go, ooh, okay, well, we'll change that. And we'll make that, you know, and I think it's the same with writing it's you know your first draft is is yours it's not no one else's that's personal that's not like yeah don't let anyone see it. that's like showing them your underwear drawer just you know it's all messy <laughs> and what are you're gonna it's like it's not tidy yet and then you're gonna make it all look nice you know and um yeah don't also the other thing when when you look at it with fresh eyes is you've got to take as an actor i think it's about either got to read it as Okay, if I was acting this, what would I want? Or if I'm directing this and I didn't know it, what would I need? Mm -hmm. So things like things that I'm working on to get better at as well is because obviously I've, I've directed what I've written. So I don't have to necessarily be as descriptive in the action points. Um, but I need to be better and stronger at that because I may be then not going to always direct everything yeah. that I've written. And it just it's just best practice to learn it now anyway. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, and then just follow loads of... Twitter is brilliant. There's so much good advice about writing on Twitter. I need to get on Twitter because... Oh. Or, or X, I'm sorry. X, sorry, X, <laughs> uh, yeah. I kind of, yeah, had the account on Twitter for like, I don't know, if it, well, whenever it, it, it launched, like I had an account there, but I I don't really use it at all. Oh, I don't know why. I, like, I'm, I'm really? like, I'm the old, old school. I'm like, Facebook. Facebook, <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> so uh, the thing that I like about X as well is that it's because um, you can make lists mm -hmm. and so in my like I have you know casting director list director list film production from companies from marketing from data and screenwriters and, you know and then you've got your own algorithm you just click on that list that you've created and you can just follow and loads of them give advice I didn't know that yeah so I've got like 260 screenwriters in my list it's just like give, yeah. give me osmosis yeah. make, me, make me good as you you know yeah. and I think like if you and, and a lot of them do wonderful podcasts also and things like that so yeah um, well, one, one of the things that, like, one of the segments that we have in our podcast called One Cool Thing was actually stolen from the podcast of two very, very famous good writers that's called uh, Script Notes by uh, John August and Craig Mason. Yes, yes, exactly. Script Notes is great. Yeah. And there's also, like, so there's one book, um, I can't remember which one it is, it's over there, but one um, screenwriting book that I've got that I, I was listening to on podcasts, mm -hmm. uh, on Audible, sorry. So whenever I was out, I'd be listening to it. And then it was so good that I was like, I need to buy the book as well. And so <laughs> write notes on the book and then listen. So I think there's such a what you don't have to nowadays, you don't have to pay to go to Yeah, it's true. To train. We we have so much resources yeah. right now that are available for us just yeah. for free. For free, you, exactly. Like, the only problem right now, like with in comparison, if you like take some free stuff that like free information that you can find, uh in comparison to some structured courses, you have to structure it. You have to like, you have like, the, because there's a lot of information, but it's like very kind of random and you don't know what you will get like at this point. Yeah. So it might take you longer, but it's all there. It's all there. No, it Do is. It. I think it's also, it depends on your learning style is what I would say also. Like if your learning style is you need to have someone with you to check your work, then self-study is not the one. Whereas my learning style is very much, tell me once, go away, and now I'm going to practice. Mm. <laughs> and then that's that's the way that I learn. So I think that the um, the online stuff, yeah. If, it, if that's your learning style, I think go for it that way. But even like if you learn yourself, if, if you need someone to, like, I, I agree. I think like I, I need people to look at what I do and then tell me if it's good or bad. Mm -hmm. I like when they say it's good, but like when they say it's bad and they say why, I also kind of appreciate it. But to start, like there's like even just to gather the information, to kind of figure out what you want to get, like, and, and just to realize the, even the, the first steps of the industry you want to learn in, like it's just, there's, there's a lot.
lot because most people when they start doing something especially creative they have no idea that like every creative profession is a profession it's a skill and there is a lot of rules that like well i don't follow the rules because i'm special you can break the rules when you know the rules and you know why you're breaking them but you need yeah. to learn the otherwise it's just a mistake <laughs> yeah absolutely that and people will see it as a mistake yeah. i think because that's for me when i took that time because i'd had such a long time out and i'd been luckily doing the inside man but i hadn't been having any of the castings or doing anything else it felt so on the acting front it felt so like over there like how do i even get to that i don't understand it um but luckily and, and it was quite funny because it was like i need I was doing like innovation workshops at, Lon at London Business School, one of the best business schools in the world. And I'm like doing, leading these workshops and stuff with, to do the strategy for the whole school. And I'm like, why am I not doing this on me? Because that's over there and I don't understand it. I just need to do it on me. And so then it was breaking it down. So what are the things, what are the immediate things that are in my control that I can learn that then makes it feel less far away? Yeah. Hence why I did the 21 day self tape challenge, like setting up um, your self tape equipment, your lights, learning scripts every single day. Cause that's a muscle memory. Yeah. People who were like, oh, I couldn't possibly learn that. Well, you, you could, if you practice, I can't pick up a violin and play a concerto or whatever now, but if I practiced, well, I mean, concerto is probably wrong, <laughs> but you know, um, but yeah. And so it's those sorts of things. So what then, what steps can you do? So then it was like, you know, if I did the 21 day self tape challenge, then doing the workshops, oh, get to know what the casting directors do, then get to know, and it's the same, it's the same with writing. I don't know, it feels so over there. So what do I do? Well, what are other people doing? Read about it. How do they structure it? What's the, start with the tried and tested ways and then go, oh, actually, this is more my way. Mm -hmm. But you know, you know, and do it in that way. So find out what your, yeah, what are the things that's in your control mm -hmm. and then manage them. And talking about the ways. Yeah. So as an actor, we, we talked a little bit about you as a writer, but like, as an actor, like, what's your process? When you're learning, like you're preparing for the role, for the scene, Yeah. you know, what, what's, what's your process? So I actually think that since I've directed, my process has become stronger, interestingly. I think, and writing, I think they all go hand in hand. Um, but now I tend to look at, uh, so I look at the script, I read it through a number of times, the whole script. Mm -hmm. um, and then look at my scenes again, then separately within the script. So where, where is that in the story? Um, and then focusing on my scenes. And then within those scenes, then I will, if it's a brand new character, obviously if it's Fiona, and I know Fiona really well, Fiona the inside man. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, so I don't have to then think like, oh, what's, you know, what's her life story? No, because I, I know that already. But if it's, a, if it's a script that I don't know any of that, then I have to think about, well, first I go from what they used to say was given circumstances. But I think, um, which is a Stanislavski term that use at drama school, I just think facts. It's just facts. Mm -hmm. What are the facts in the script? Yeah. <laughs> Let's just use normal language. So the facts in the scripts are I said, or, uh, you know, or, or there's an, I've done an action or I'm saying something or someone else is saying that I'm tired. I'm a tired, I've got a kid, I'm exhausted, I'm a single mom. I'm okay. So those are my facts. So then I've got, oh, I can, I'm understanding. I'm not a single mom, but I, I understand how hard it must be. You understand exhaustion. <laughs> right, I understand exhaustion. And, and you know what? I probably don't even understand exhaustion to that level. So it's like, okay, right, now. So then also holding the things together. So that gives you a platform to work on from there and the starting point. So then what else are other people saying about you or not? Or what are you saying about yourself that someone else is differing mm -hmm. from? So, but if I'm saying it, then that is my truth. But if someone else is saying it, okay, then I've got an opposition. Mm -hmm. So I'm displaying something else. Mm -hmm. that go, which we all do, right? That's, we all project what we want people to see but isn't necessarily how we feel inside. So then that gives a nice uh, flaw because uh, we're all flawed and it adds the extra layers. So then you can look at that. So once I've looked at all of those different things, and there'll always be a little bit that'll tell you about when you first introduce as a character, there'll always be a little bit that'll tell you about who you are as well. So you can use that. And then I start to go through through the subtext. Mm -hmm. Um Actually, before I do the subtext, what I often do is look at the other person's lines. Mm -hmm. I tend to learn all the lines um, and because I just find it easier. That's just the way my brain works. But so if someone says something to me, it's more, how do I, how does that make me feel? So, you know, if you're like, um, I don't know, how's your kid doing at school? Hmm. 
I'm like, oh shit, I better lie. Mm-hmm. Uh, brilliant. As opposed, to, do, do you know what I mean? Like, so you know that you've got, then you can get a, a shift in your eyes mm. or or how, I don't know, whatever the question can be. Do you want a cup of tea? And mm. like, yeah, yeah, I really do. I don't, whatever it is, yeah. every single line I go through like that. What is, and it's a very simple, it's not like I'm depressed, I'm angry, I'm happy. I just go, what is the, how does it just make you feel? Just, just normal. Yeah. Um, and then I can go on to other things. Then you can go deeper into it. Then it's like, okay, now I'm on this. I'm trying to persuade. I'm trying to antagonate. I'm trying to, you know, adjectives, action words. Um, and then so then you layer all of those on top. Learn your lines, then forget them all and someone else speaks and just hope it goes all right. <laughs> <laughs> but like when you pre- prepare like that, because yeah. most of this preparation is you're at home, alone, maybe with your partner, your friend, like you're preparing this, uh, all this stuff, but then you come to the set mm-hmm. and then there is another live person in front of you. Like how how different is your performance on the day in comparison to what you actually prepare at home? I think it oftentimes depends on um, how do you see the scene is, I would say. So because if it's a, a big high emotional scene, then you um, you don't really know as long as you know the the, the a thought process of it, then you're okay. But you don't really know how it's going to play out because I don't know how the other person's going to act, mm-hmm. actually. Um, if it's a very operational scene, like you're playing a day player, then it's probably just going to be the same as you did it at home, right? <laughs> you know, so you don't need to overthink it. Uh, so I think that those, there's, you know, so obviously there's those arcs. And I think in knowing... It's such an old saying, but it's so true. Um, it, like if you know your lines inside and out, and then it, it doesn't matter how the other person acts. You could they could give you a different read every single time, and you you'd still act off it because you the words are now coming so natural to you mm-hmm. because you've done all of that other groundwork. Because somewhere in your brain, because you've learned the thoughts as opposed to learning the lines. Mm-hmm. So if you've done all of those other things, it's like if I've if I've in my mind or in my work, pre-work, thought I'm going to lie to you about my child at school, but then, I don't know, the director's like, you're really happy, then that's such an easy twist. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I think it just, and that's a play, isn't it? And always ask the other person if you can do a read-through, mm. just if you can practice. So then you can go, oh, maybe yeah. I have a sense of how you're going to read this. Yeah. Because also the other thing is on TV and film, it's very rare that it's only one and done of a whole thing anyway. Um so the camera would normally be on an establishing shot wide when you do it the first time. So even if the other actor doesn't want to give you a read through, you're like, I see yeah, how you're yeah, going to yeah. read this. All right. I know where we're going. Yeah. But just still be open to it. It's playing essentially, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. Uh, are there any uh, inspirations for you like right now in, in the acting world, like the biggest inspirations that you have? I have lots, actually. Like I've never been one of these people who's like when they're always like, who do you want to be? Or, you know, who would be who do you admire the most? I ever have one person. I have like lots of people um, like I mean, I think Sarah Lancashire is doing some incredible work. Uh, she's always doing incredible work. Um, I had a whole list actually of British female actresses who'd started off in Coronation Street and who are now, you know, mm-hmm. smashing the world up. I mean, I think like when I watch um, like Anthony Hopkins, um, I can't remember the name of his last film where he played the Holocaust uh, survivor. Oh my gosh. Oh, I forgot. Yeah. You, you'll see it on screen. <laughs> yeah. You'll see, yeah. He's, and watch it. He is a mate that beautiful, just such delicate, nuanced performance that he gives. Um, and how you can just see it in his eyes, like, wow, you know, that's just so, um, yeah, so amazing. And her, I don't know. I think that's that's the thing for me is it depends on what I watch and at the time. It's more like the most, like, the latest thing that actually kind of affected you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. at that moment. Yeah. yeah. And so I understand I'm the same because right now, like, all, all I can think about is the bear. No, right, which I still need to watch. Yes. I did a podcast with uh, Onya Rose Daly, my friend, and she is on The Boiling Point. Oh, it was brilliant. Which was brilliant. Like the series and the film, like I think they're very, very good. And now The Bear, I think it's so close energy wise mm-hmm. to to The Boiling Point. Like it's just, it's very different. But at the same time, it's like the same thematics because it's like kitchen, a restaurant, yeah. uh, chefs. But it, and also the energy wise, it's very close. Mm-hmm. And I just feel like 
I want another season of both. And then I want a crossover. <laughs> oh, in the crowd, really? Wow. That, would, that would be, uh, obviously, it will never happen, but yeah. it would be amazing. <laughs> so, I'm, well, we've just started watching um, Baby Reindeer. Mm. My gosh, the woman in Baby, I mean, they're both very good. The woman in Baby Reindeer, wow, what a performance. Like, I was, you know, when we were watching it last night, and I was just like, gosh, she's so good, isn't she? Look at her. Yeah. And uh, as a, you know, working class actress, mm -hmm. Like, do you, do you think it, it's it's harder for people from working class families to to do it in arts in the UK? Yeah, definitely, a hundred percent. I think um, because now, like, how even if you, so, when I now went to drama school and I got the full scholarship, uh, and it was thirty grand then. Like, I don't know, God, I think it's thirty grand a year now. Like, how would you afford that? And but I was even I was lucky enough to also get a student loan on top of that. Um, to help cover some of the expenses, um, but you don't get a student loan now anymore. So how could you possibly ever go? And then things like, like if COVID hadn't have happened and I hadn't have stayed living in a condemned flat, <laughs> I couldn't have saved money to have been freelance for a year. Mm. So I never would have had this opportunity to to do to to make films to try this out. It takes. Money gives you opportunity. Even even a thimble of money gives you opportunity. If you don't have that, you don't have that opportunity. Mm. Um, and there is still a class system in the UK where people look at you at how you speak. You know, you can tell your your class by your accent, and that also shuts some doors at different levels. You know, um, so I, I think it's I think it's a huge problem. I think it's it's becoming even more elitist. That the price of Theatre is so expensive. The price of the cinema in a lot of places is so expensive. And they're reducing arts in schools. So how do... Yeah, I just think you're cutting it off to... Arguably, these people are some of the people that need the arts the most. Yeah, yeah, because I think... Our, like uh, I don't remember, I was watching, I think, James McAvoy just recently. Yes. I watched this interview about his, like, he, he's telling, like, that, that actually for work-class kids from the work-class families, arts is actually opens your mind more. You learn more about the world, which you need to get out of it or just like to... Because otherwise, you just get, you get stuck. Yeah. yeah. Well, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, it challenges perception as well, which is if you, you know, if you're from a really working class family, you can't afford to go on holidays. You can't afford to eat in restaurants. You can't afford to go to the theater, go to the museum, go to gigs, go to. So, so you, your learning is just from that echo chamber. Right. And, and so how do you learn any more than that? And then not all working class families, but a lot struggle too and and art is an es the arts is an escapism and if that's closed off i just think it i just think it's awful and and i do think it's getting harder um i also <laughs> right topically i also think that whilst they're doing things for younger people um so there's a lot of i can't remember the terminology that they use but it's like people who are just coming in to the profession and they're trying to help them and, and doing a lot with working class and whatnot. If you have had to work or had kids or what had to work to get some money to back you, there's none of that to help you now. Mm -hmm. So that tends to stop at 25 at the max. So all of these other up and coming things, you're now no longer because you were poor and you couldn't do it before. Mm -hmm. And so I just think it's, um, yeah, I think it's a tragedy because we're missing out on so many excellent voices. Yeah, it's true. That's true. Uh, because I, I spoke about it as well with my uh, friend and acting teacher, Lee Lomas. Mm -hmm. And he's also from Working Actors uh, work Actor Studio. He is from working family, like working class family. And he also, like he, he was, I remember, uh, we talked about, he said like, it's basically, first of all, there is, especially for, for, for boys, uh, there is not a lot of boys from working uh, class families yeah. who actually want, even want to try arts or like acting because for them it seems like, oh, like that's not even a real job, like whatever. Yeah. So yeah, I think, I think it's, uh, well, I think that's a big problem. Also as well, it, because it's, um, it's considered a bit feminine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. and so so there's a lot of boys who would take it at school just to um have a doss around and to not really that's a very black pool expression that I've just realized most people are not might not understand. <laughs> to be lazy, to be lazy, um, as opposed to doing it because they want to be. Secretly they probably want to be creative. But I think um, yeah, so then there's a lot of boys who don't do it, and then there's pressure on boys to go into a trade and not 
Yeah, 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 because he he said oh, Lee, Lee said that the, he said like first like year or so when I was doing acting like even like in in the, uh, after school, I lied to my friends like almost none of my friends knew what I was doing because it's just like I I couldn't tell them because it, it considered like just well that's come on yeah which is that again then which is why we go back to when we we're talking about drama school before mm. and and classes there's more women that go into it but there's more men that have parts and again because. When you flip it onto the other side, there was a lot more male playwrights than mm -hmm. there was females. Yeah. So there's more male part. And so it's this weird dichotomy of like, we've got, all, why can't we just all do it? Why can't we just all do it? Instead of, yeah, make it even. But there you are. <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah. Let's hope. One day. Let's hope. <laughs> yeah. All right, look, Changing Tides. Mm -hmm. So the short film that you wrote, you directed, and I, as I understand, it's a very, very personal story for you. Yes. Can you tell me more about it? Just like, how did it start? How did the idea come to you? How much time you spent on actually even thinking about like, should you do it or not? Yeah, so um, so I wrote, I think it was the year before on Father's Day, I wrote a spoken word poem um, about Father's Day, about how I um, wished that I could just a personal personal poem basically about things that I missed about him and um, some of his bad sides. And I suppose that was one of the first times I'd spoken so openly about that. I had had a poem published um, years earlier called Roots, which, but, but I didn't perform it. So it was just a written poem um, and no one really knew that, it, that that was me and my dad. So, um, I was quite nervous about doing the spoken word poem at first because obviously it's not just my story. I've got mom, my mom and two sisters um, and he has a brother and, you know, all the rest of it. Uh, but they were very um, supportive of me doing that. And I guess that was sort of the catalyst of, it, of me thinking, all right, it's okay to talk about it. Mm -hmm. He's also been dead for 16 years. I don't think I could have said it any earlier, really. Um because it takes a long time to understand and to heal. And I, um, so then anyway, so I wrote, again, I think it just bleh, came out of me one day, uh, the first script. Um, and then um, I sent it to a few of my friends to see what they thought and they gave some feedback. And then I just kept churning out these different drafts. It was like, it was like I was possessed. Mm -hmm. I don't know what was happening. It was sort of uncontrollable. Um, and then I saw the BBC Writers um, com uh, competition that they do, the Open Writers Programme. And I decided, and it was two weeks, and it was like a challenge. Like I didn't really think I'd get through, but I might as well just do it. So I turned this 10-page script in two weeks into a 57-page TV pilot whilst working full-time. Oh, my, I was so numb all over. I couldn't even stand. Oh, my God. It was agony. Anyway, I did it. Um, I didn't get through to the next round, but I did it anyway. Yeah. But from then, then I was like, oh, I've seen all this scope. And it made me, I guess I was quite therapeutic, actually. Um, and so I stripped it back down again to a short and then thought, I wonder if, I wonder if I could get this made. Now, I wasn't going to direct originally. Um, I was going to just produce it. Because I've been a project director at LBS, um, and like I worked on their, setting up one of their um, premier uh, their programs that they'd, uh, for the first time flagship program that they'd ever had, and I worked on the 200 million pound fundraising campaign. So like, I can do project management like with my eyes closed. That's fine. That's very easy. So that's what I was going to do. And I found, weirdly, Again, Twitter X. Mm -hmm. um, someone had said, "Put your um, do a thread of all the up and coming British directors." So whenever anyone does that, I'm like bookmark. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I went on it, and there was a. So I was going through all of them and looking at them, and uh, there was one guy who was from Blackpool as well. So I messaged him, sent him the log line, and uh, he had said to send him the script. We met, and he was really keen on directing it. Um, but he kept saying he was brilliant. He's a brilliant guy, really good director. And he was like, but if you want to direct this, you should. I would love to, but if you want to. Then I went home at Christmas and I, could, I couldn't stop seeing the shots. And I was like, I'm so sorry, I, I'm going to have to do this. And he was like, no, honestly, it's totally fine. Um, but then I needed a producer, I thought. So then I went out again on X, asked people if there was any producers. Um, 
sent the script to a few people, but they weren't, they didn't have, they had, they couldn't do it that year. And I wanted to do it last year. So then ended up producing it as well, myself. It's so funny, the two actors who were in it, they were like, this is like being on Netflix. But like, it, it was like being on the inside, Matt, you know, all the, the sheets, the daily, the all the things. Um, and, um, but I wanted to film it in Blackpool. And so I was looking at options for getting kit in Blackpool because I don't, I've not lived there for more years than I lived there. I don't want to give my age away. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so I don't know who's, um, I didn't know who was there. So I started to look for uh, production companies in Blackpool, found this one um, called Out of the Ark, and he'd won a few awards as well in film festivals. And I was like, and it's got a drone and all this. And I thought, brilliant. So then we went on, uh, we decided we'd work together. He introduced me to Dave, who plays Aiden. I kind of already knew the girl who plays B, um, but I actually emailed the head of my old drama school asking her if she had any recommendations for someone. And she recommended her and I sort of kind of knew her and I was like, oh, brilliant. And that's great. Well, I'll ask her. Um, so that's how that came. And then, yeah, and then we got into shooting and that's sort of how that came about. But I did along the way want to make sure that my family felt OK with it. So they read the scripts before we went into production um they were with me along the whole way um I did a kickstarter campaign as well too actually um and I talked to them about what I was going to do beforehand because I don't want to it is their story of course. um so I did a whole yeah a whole campaign before I launched the kickstarter as well telling my story every day um and through that I found a charity called Nakoa, the National Association of Children of Alcoholics um and pff, that's totally changed my life. Yeah. Like, I cannot believe I didn't know about that when I was going through everything with dad. Um, and so I've become a massive advocate of them. And um, and then they've been really supportive of me and that whole community as well. And then, yeah, then we filmed it. And yeah, the rest of how, how was How was it directing for the first time? Like something? Oh, gosh, I was so nervous. But I was so nervous. But also because I know, having worked in business and been an actor, mm -hmm is like, you need to look the most in control. Even if you're nervous, don't let anyone else know that. Just don't show that because um, then they they could lose trust in you. So I, so I use actually a lot of different elements of what I've used in business before, what I've seen on set before, and, and again, fully immerse myself in director's podcast, mm -hmm. directing actors, all of these different things. Um, and so uh, I stole a Philip Baroncini thing, uh, which we do in business anyway, which is having a um, sit down meeting every day before you start. Uh, so everyone's together. We all have our breakfast together. We all talk. Everyone knows what's happening, what the day's plan is. Mm -hmm. um, and then it just makes everyone really calm. So I think on set, that's the most important thing. But I also know from business, beyond when you come to launch go live as you can call it in project management um, do the prep beforehand and so I had two rehearsal or one rehearsal with each of the um, actors before on zoom three hours each um, but prior to that I'd gone through the script which was nuts right I mean gosh <laughs> I may have OCD but um, so the script that I wrote that I'd lived I went through it and I wrote 10,000 words of notes on it, which is mm -hmm. insane, isn't it? From, a, again, Periscope up. So what could this line be? If it's played this way, what does that mean? If it's played that way, what does this mean? If it's How does then that knock onto that to have the effect that I need from this last point? Um, so I'd done all of that. So then by the time I get into the rehearsal with them, then I, was, I could give them, talk to them about what options they want, give them different options, tell them where we're going to get to. So actually when they got on set, it was like, they were both so grounded in who they were. We actually smashed the, <laughs> the schedule like every day. And it was like, it took minimal direction because we'd done so much of the pre-work already. How how different was their performance in the end? They're like the, 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 the characters that they created from what you've seen in your head when you were writing it? Uh, no, I think it was spot. Yeah. yeah. I think if anything, actually B is a bit softer. Um, but because um, B is sort of me and I would have been a bit more like, like that uh, but um, she was a bit softer but the interesting point was was you know some of the nuances that like we'd worked on with them 
at the beginning that added a few more layers that they may have not seen um, had we not gone through the script like we had line by line. So like at first, um, you know, B was, because she's the only actual person on the cast and crew um, that hasn't had an experience of alcoholism mm -hmm. as a family member. Um, whereas Dave, who plays Aiden, his ex-wife died of alcoholism as well. So he, he could almost come straight in because he knows that. Um, and so there was some moments like, but, but why, why would she forgive him then? It's like, because she just do. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you know, that's, but we, so we had to, you know, so we worked behind unpacking some of that and it is, and that was quite cathartic as well. And it's like, why, you know, that's the, that's the struggle. And that's what I want this story to show is as a person that cares for someone with an addiction, it's that roller coaster of emotions that you go on. It's not a commentary on how people become addicted. It's a commentary on the lives of an addict. Do you see what I mean? Mm. Um, addict and the people who surround him. Yeah, exactly. And and the addict themselves, one the, once they've got to end of life stage where that realization comes on them too. Um, yeah, as opposed to it being, you know, any any sort of um, display of oh alcoholism this leads to alcoholism that's not what this is about yeah it's it's not a commercial or like or you know it's it's just a story of real people but just real is, people yeah. yeah character very character driven and and i think that's what um those two are such good actors as well and and i think really getting under those layers that's why there's some there's some beautifully nuanced performances from the two of them um and it was great i loved it and i want to do more and how long do you take it to shoot it edit it and you know etc cetera, etc cetera. so um i think to write it i think i started writing it in october and then i had my final draft that we filmed the shooting draft ready in january but that's going from the 54 pages of things mm -hmm. and then you know um and then um then we ended up we didn't film until june for a few reasons um Chris and out of the arc, he was filming something else in May. I originally wanted it to be in May, but he was filming something else. And actually June is just before season starts in Blackpool, really, because the school holidays are still there. So um, the weather should be better. It, there should be a few people, but so so that's really why. So we didn't necessarily need that longer pre-production, pre um, but it was more timing. And then, so once I finished at London Business School on the 30th of March, I just went, <laughs> all in on pre-production. So yeah, I mean, Gantt charts, flow charts, stripe boards, all, all, all of the things, storyboards, shot lists, all the stuff. And um, then we filmed four days, but actually in hindsight, because of the prep that I'd done with the actors, we could have done it in three, mm. which, but it's a 22 minute film. Mm. So actually that's like four days should have been right. Uh, <laughs> but, but I think definitely if you front load it, then it, it just, helps um but it meant we could get some more nice drone shots as well which is nice and seagulls and stuff um and then edit so we edited and we had uh so i don't you may have noticed from this chat i don't ever do things by halves and um and i decided to do three screenings so we're gonna have three screenings partly because i'd done this kickstarter and not only had people given me money um, they told me their stories. I had so many people opening up that they'd never told anyone before that their parent was an alcoholic. Um, and, um, and all the Nakoa people and the, all of this. So I decided to do three screenings. Uh, one was September and two were in October. So we had the premiere screening in Blackpool on the 19th of October and two weeks later, Manchester, two weeks later, London in um, Crouch End. And then, um, so we had to be ready for that, <laughs> the 19th of September. So we finished in June, had to be ready for the 19th of September. It was ready two weeks before. No, it was ready three weeks before, but it wasn't. Mm. <laughs> it came back and we had a bit of a crisis. So actually at those three screenings, they were more the, um, what do you call it when like the big films test screen you're all basically test, test screen, screen. Yeah. there you go so they were more like a test screen if you will um so after doing those three screenings then it went back into edit with uh, another editor um who worked on the sound and the color grading and then we got it 
final lock ready on the 5th of February. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it's such a long process. Yes. <laughs> yes. How, how did you find the crew and people who worked like on editing and everything? Um, so I thought it was the crew. Oh, it was on set. It was so lovely. Um, we all really gelled. And I think one of the important things to say, because this was a personal story, my sister was already, was one of the runners as well, my elder sister. Um, and we wanted to make sure, I wanted to make sure that crew normally accept a job because they want money. Yeah. Actors accept the job because they like the script. So I wanted to make sure that everyone involved read the script first, including crew, because does it resonate? If they're like, mm. Well, that's a sad loser and I don't see the point. I don't want you on my film. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Not this one anyway, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we had this uh so we had this cast and crew that were all really sympathetic and empathetic to the subject matter, to each other. So it was really lovely. So like we'd and it was blisteringly hot as well, which is very unlike Blackpool. So we'd film something and then we'd come and sit out on the lawn and everybody chat and laugh and joke, but then they'd share their personal stories as well in relation to what we've just shot. Mm -hmm. And everybody listen and we had a mental health first aider there. I'm a mental health first aider as well, but I thought I might have needed it. So we had another one. Um, And um, yeah, and so then we could all talk about it and we could share and each other's stories and I think that made it, and then the the meetings in the morning as well, it just made it really tight and really, um, just a really lovely script. We're all still in a a, a WhatsApp group together and stuff as well. How how, how do you find them? Uh, So I found um, Chris, the guy who was filming Out of the Ark. He brought Adam, um, my boyfriend who's in the other room. Uh, he brought Adam as the unit photographer. Um, he brought the makeup girl, Ellie, um, and he brought Agatha, who was the first aide. He introduced me to um, Dave, who plays Aizen. And I saw his show reel and I was like, he was like, when he read the script, he was like, I don't, I hope you don't think I'm out of line, but I think this guy would be quite good. I've known him for years. I watched it. I was like, oh my God, he's perfect. Um, then, as I said, with, I, I contacted the head of Mount View, who I still know. Um, she recommended Natasha, who I already sort of knew a little tiny bit. Um, Marion, my first ever drama teacher, she was the paramedic in it. So I contacted her and asked her. Um, Anton, I asked, I was doing another acting job um and i overheard somewhere so he was chatting or something and everyone was saying where they're from he was a runner on it and he said that he lives in blackpool and i was like do you are you free in dune and he was lovely and so he came on board he was a uh, runner and um transport and then crazily <laughs> we were at the inside man premiere at leicester square mm-hmm. so i'd been doing my fundraising campaign thinking as well like no one's really going to be interested in my two bit first ever film you know we're at the premiere and Trinda, who's, as you know, is our DOP, fantastic DOP, uh, came up to me and was like, May, May, can I, can I film your film? I was like, sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, I've already got someone. Um, I just didn't think he'd be interested. I didn't think anyone would really care about my little film. Anyway, he came on and he did all the BTS uh, filming. So what we ended up having as well is we've got a 22 minute short film and a 17 minute making of documentary Mm. where we go under the skin of the film but also everyone else's personal stories that relate to the film um and he filmed that and then that's that's what i was thinking because you said like there are so many people who actually shared their stories even from people who are from from kickstarter you you could actually do like an additional piece with like just just all, all the interviews and just combine them together as yeah nice yeah so we have we've got that obviously whilst changing tides on the festival circuit you can't have it online to screen anywhere else and so um, at the three screenings that I did, that the, the making of was filmed there. But then once it's um, once I can get Changing Towns out there, then the two will be out there together as well. So tell me, how is it going with festivals? So uh, it's got, so far so good. Uh, festivals are again a lot of rejection. By the way, also big question. Yes, I know it's a big like big struggle. But can you explain the process? How you apply for festivals? What is the usual process? And how you choose festivals you want to be in? Yes. So uh, there are quite literally thousands of film festivals. Um, there is a site called Film Freeway. There are other sites as well that you can use but film freeway is a bit like a portal 
that has all of these different festivals on um, and you can search for different criteria like short or like if you want to just do screenwriting you just do screenwriting and it'll show you the screenwriting competitions or short film or whatever they vary the range of entry fee varies widely um, so you have to think about that so on the fundraising that I did um, I always had in mind that that budget some of that budget is for this part as well because mm-hmm. it costs a lot of money um, and well, what's a lot well gosh some of them are like if you get like a late entry some of them can be like a hundred quid yeah if you can get early bird entry obviously that's the best mm. um yeah so there are film festival strategists that are out there mm-hmm. um some are reportedly better than others um but yeah i think you can also do your own strategy yeah. as well um so one of the things that I looked for with Changing Tides was anything that is got a mental health slant, um, anything that's got a social impact slant, um, things that are um, festivals that are up and coming, um, festivals that have anything as a, a category as new filmmaker, mm-hmm. um, new director, those sorts of things. And then a couple of wild card expensive um, bougie ones that you just, you know, got to hope for and see see what happens. Uh, and then anything within the locality of which it was filmed also, because obviously there's a festival in Lytham, which is uh, down the road from Blackpool. Um, and obviously have, you know, it's a hometown film. So there's more likelihood, hopefully, <laughs> that it would get in. So those are the things that I would say is, you know, pick a... If you're a horror film, you know, definitely don't ever submit to something that's potentially Mm -hmm. rom-coms. So just think about where is your genre? Where does it fit? Um, Where does it, what audiences would want to see it? Mm -hmm. Um, Do do, do you think about like uh, how prestigious is the, 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 were, were there any kind of, you know, Festivals that you felt like, no, I don't even want to touch it with 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 a stick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, uh, like, no, I think there's a couple of festivals that I've gone like I'm waiting to <laughs> I'm waiting to hear from one in the next few days, and I'm like, well, I don't think I'm going to get it. But why not? Yeah. Why not apply anyway? Because you know, in its winner. Mm-hmm. Um, so some of the like big like Biffa qualifying, Oscar qualifying, um, those sorts of things. Um, BAFTA qualifying, they're obviously a lot harder to get into because a lot more people apply for them. Mm-hmm. Like I think um, I went to Sundance last year. In fact, I go to Sundance London. I go every year for the last few years, but I can't because I'm in Romania this year. Um, but they say their festival programmer, they normally get something like 15,000 shorts. Yeah, which is insane, right? Yeah. And then obviously there's also things with my film because it's 22 minutes. So... Like there's a wonderful festival called Tweet Fest that I go to every year that I love. Um, But I can't submit for that because you've got to be 20 minutes and under. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, so there's different criteria that you have. But I don't think, I think everything, every festival's got its own merit. Um, If it's, if the festival, if it's screened at the festival, it's more prestigious than if it's viewed online. Um, But, you know, just getting into a festival is Good because the, as I said, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people. Enter. How do, I'm, I'm just curious, like with festivals like that, but like with so what do you say, fifteen thousand? Oh, That's Sundance, oh. so bear in mind. But still, like that cream o'clock. Who is the jury who decides like this is will get into the like how how many people are watching this? It's not like there is one guy who just like okay, no. a lot more. But no, but they have, so they have a panel of people and that's their full-time job. But like some festivals will outsource to some people who, who watch them, but the majority of the big festivals, they have a panel of people who it is, that is, that's their job. Um, and like some of the festivals, but the film will be watched by three people. So you'll tend to have like, that will be the uh, feature festival team, uh, the features team, sorry, the documentary team, the shorts. Mm-hmm. So you, they won't have to cross over. Arguably, they've probably got it better because it's the shorts. <laughs> watch more, but then they're having to watch a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, you know. But then you would turn it, uh, so they would watch it, and then I, I guess they say maybe, and someone else then watches it maybe, and then then they decide if it's going to go through. I mean, obviously, it's a bit like a self tape. I think also um, it, it grabs you in the first portion of it. If it doesn't grab them, then 
probably they won't watch all of it. That's also the danger. So the sweet spot with a short film is 12 minutes yeah. or 10. You've got a lot more chance of getting in. So I know that I've hindered myself when it's been 20 minutes. But I think particularly with Changing Tides, the film festivals is the icing. It is, you know, it's a, yeah, it's an icing on the cake. But the whole purpose of it is, is so other people that care for alcoholics and, and, and who love to have that life are seen. It's more what it, about what happens to it after the festival. Mm-hmm. It's just that this gives it validation. Um, but if you are writing a, a film to do well in a festival and that's your strategy, then sort of 12, 10, 12 minutes is your, mm-hmm. your sweet spot. Yeah. So how long will be your, your festival run? Uh, it's normally 12 to 18 months, uh, depending on when the last one is. Uh, the last festival that's happened. So I only started uh, putting them in in February. I only started finding out about them in, uh, where are we now? In May. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was about May or June. So I've so far been a finalist at um, Liverpool Indie Festival. I've been in Liftoff Manchester and Wolverhampton. Just. Mm -hmm. Uh, So yeah, and I'm waiting to hear. I think there's about, I don't know, there's about 27 that I'm waiting to hear from. And tell us more about your award. Yay! <laughs> so uh, I was at the wonderful Wolverhampton Film Festival um, just the other weekend. Um, there's such good people as well. Like, I, I don't think I've been to a friendlier festival. Mm. Um, and so we got selected, which was huge, just to even be selected. It's a three-day event. Um, and I messaged them because... It's, It was on the same weekend that I was doing a 21-mile hike for Nakoa. Um, so they very kindly moved my screening to the Sunday. Mm-hmm. So I did the 21-mile hike um, in the Peak District. And then the next morning we drove, we, I don't drive, Adam, drove to Wolverhampton. Mm-hmm. Um, and we watched the, the film there with our achy legs. And then we went to the award ceremony that evening because it was nominated for Best New Filmmaker, uh, with seven other films who were nominated, and it won. Nice. Ah! Congratulations. I know. Are you happy that you told the story? Yeah. Yeah. Have you, have your perspective on, on everything uh, changed even a little bit after you wrote it, after you kind yeah. of, yeah? Definitely. I, I'm, I, for many years, so you carry a lot of shame when you're, um, a child or a partner or, or whatever, parent of a um, mm-hmm. sibling, of someone with addiction. Um, and as a child, you carry a lot of uncertainty of, was it me? Was it my fault? Mm. Was I not good enough? Um, and then, and that takes a long time to go. Um, and then once that happened, after that, you, you get to this whole like anger part as well, where it's, you really... You know, why didn't you love me enough to stop? And I think from doing this, I feel such a sense of calm about it now. I feel so like I, he was just a flawed man. He was mm. just a very troubled, depressed man. He didn't, you know, it's it's a mental condition. It's not, he wasn't, he wasn't doing it to hurt me or anyone else. You know, and we're all so just, a fragment away from that happening ourselves, I think it's made me a lot more understanding. You know, if something massive could happen in your life, a tragedy, and, and it could happen the same, you know, it doesn't have to be, and any class, any amount of money, this this can happen because you don't become an addict because you're happy. You, you, you do it because you're covering up something. And then, you know, and then once you have covered that up, Then there's all the shame associated with what you've done to cover it up to then stop. You've got to address all of that. So I think anyone who who finds that strength is remarkable and admirable. And but there is hope in that, and people can do it. And I think that's where I that's definitely what's helped now. I think it's made me and my family have more dialogue about it. And also finding the coa, because you don't know. It's such a private thing because it happens in, behind closed doors and no one talks about it that you think that your situation is so unique to you. And I've met I, with Nakoa, we've been in um, the Houses of Parliament lobbying the government and I've heard all of these fantastic people sharing their story on stage. Politicians, speakers, influencers, sports people. And we're all from entirely different backgrounds and our experiences are so similar. Mm. And it makes me, oh, it gets me a bit teary even thinking about it. Like, 
the, the community that I found in Nakoa uh, and this ability that people have felt that they could trust in me and tell me their stories is something um, that I feel it, it can be quite overwhelming sometimes. Um, but it's also, it makes me feel like something good has come from all of this, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so, yeah. So I'm really, I'm really glad that I did it. Um, I'm really glad that it doesn't just speak for me as well. Um, I Not only did I do those screenings, I gave a private viewing link to all of the people who donated because a lot of them are in America, inside man fans, thank mm. you. Um, and um, and also NACOA members. And then them finding people who've connected with me and from festivals who also have, have um, been in recovery themselves um, or of the person who's cared for them. It's resonating with both parties, which is something bigger than I even thought it would happen. So, yeah, so I'm really, really glad. It, it takes a while to sink in sometimes. And mm. um, I find that when I do, because I'm still healing too. So sometimes when I do do Q&As or, or networking or talking about or see it, like, gosh, when we're watching it at Wolverhampton, I'm like nearly breaking Adam's arm because mm. I'm still so nervous watching it amongst other people. Um, I feel quite drained afterwards. And so I think that's, you know, but I think that's that's normal. But I'm really glad that I did it. Is there anything that you would want to say for people? First of all, maybe someone who's actually struggling with the uh, addiction themselves or to people who are close to someone like, what would you say? Don't suffer in silence. I think that the, the worst, absolute worst thing is the shame that is associated with it, which makes it, it pushes it further underground. And when it's for both parties, um, and what that does is it makes both parties spiral. Like, you know, I've definitely not been um, <laughs> 100% good all the time uh, because, you know, it makes you question yourself, your life, your worth. And the same with the person who's an addict, you know, there is help out there. There is other people who've been in this situation who they're so willing to listen and they're so willing to help in any way they can. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't want to share your story, go and, and if you don't want to go to a meeting, you don't want to go to a group, there are, just listen to podcasts. Like Nakoa, for example, has a message wall they have a free helpline as well that you can phone up. It says children and alcoholics, and obviously it's encouraged for children to phone, but you're a child until you die, right? You can phone up as an adult as well. Especially most of them. <laughs> <laughs> but you can, you know, and that, that's one thing that they actively support. But they also have this message board too. And um, so you can read other people's stories. There's a lot of people who talk about this now. The same in the in the uh, addiction space. Mm-hmm. There's so many people who online share their version of that, share their story, share what they went through. Mm-hmm. And that to me is also going back to a conversation we had before about the power of like arts and why it's so important. Is because if you can see yourself or your story in someone else that you thought that you're ashamed of or you're afraid of or you're secret, it can be so powerful Mm. because it can be, you don't have to share it, but you can understand that you're not alone. And that's so important. You're not alone. Seek people out, find people, talk if you can, or just watch and listen. I think it's so, so important. I'm guessing, well, I don't know, but I'm, I'm guessing it seems like for people who are suffering from addiction, very often the one of the, one of the big problems is to understand that it's like actually a problem. Uh, yeah. When do you realize it's harmful and how to kind of come to this? Well, I think that's, uh, yeah, I think it's when it's affecting others is when it's harmful. That's when it becomes harmful. There's, you know, there is a difference to uh, going out and drinking and having fun and then going out and drinking and now not being able to go to work, not performing as well, yeah. forgetting your kid's birthday, not washing up, not washing, not cleaning. Mm-hmm. That's a different, you know, they're, they're two different worlds. And I think once it starts to slip into the neglect of oneself or or of others, then that's when it starts to become a problem. But the thing is, is that you're the only person who can see that. You're the only person who can want to change. You mm-hmm. can't have, and that's what's hard for the people around you. Um, 
because the other people want you to change so much, but they cannot help you. They cannot. There's nothing that they can do. And so that's why the other people, there's other groups as well, like there's Al-Anon, which is, um, it's like the AA, but it's for the people, that are, um, are the family of an alcoholic or, or the narcotic drugs. Um, because for them, it, they're always wanting the change and they're seeing the, the person, it's like they they become a shell of who they form, former were, but... And, and you, you'll you argue with them, you'll scream at them, you'll want validation, but they have to want the change. They have to want it. And I think, so that's the hardest point. If they don't, my dad never did. Some people don't, you know. Um, but then, therefore, if we'd have known that there was other services for the rest of us, then that might have helped the rest of us. And I might never have taken all those years out of active. Who knows? Mm. Um, but, um, but, yeah, so I think it's, if, if, if you yourself thinks that there is a problem, then you know you go and see, go and sort help. If you are affected by somebody else's problem, then then you do that for you. You're doing it for you, um, and you, they can teach you ways of communicating and trying to, but you can never change anyone. Mm-hmm. That's, that's it's the true. truth. It's true. Uh, for someone who suffered from minor addiction to nicotine, which mm-hmm. is not the same, but I mean, like, and I started stupidly. I started smoking when I was thirty. Before wow. 30, I never smoked before. And then like I, I smoked, like started smoking stupidly when I was 30. And I just basically, I just quit this January. So like 10 years, I was smoking wow. for 10 years. And then this January, mostly because, well, I don't have money now for smoking, especially in the UK. Yeah. <laughs> it's extremely expensive. But again, like I knew that I wanted to quit. Exactly. It wasn't like, you know, at some point, like, I, the, because I tried to quit some time ago and I even quit successfully for seven months. Well done. <laughs> still, yeah. still successfully. Yeah. But I was like, my girlfriend, she was like, she didn't like me smoking. And I was like, but I kind of, I still wanted, I was craving, you know, for a cigarette for a long, long time. And then I started smoking again. But this time it feels very different because I, I just stopped because I didn't want to do it anymore. But yeah. that's, that's the main thing. I think you have to want Dude. It has to be you. Yeah, exactly. I stopped. I used to smoke loads as well. And I stopped. I can't even remember when now. Because I don't, that's the other thing is that when you've truly stopped, you don't even count anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> it's like, I don't know, it was years ago. But I used to smoke all the time, all the time. It was but drama school, nonstop. It was, it was in the fag shed. And then it just got to the point and it was, I was so, I was so sick of it. Mm-hmm. I'm so like, I can't, This yeah. I'm so sick. And it was still when you could smoke in pubs and I was working in a pub and it, it just, I, I woke up the next morning and I had a hangover and I was like, smell it all on me. And I was like, oh no, that's it, done. Mm-hmm. And then just, yeah. But you have to, but it, there was, again, it's a bit like we're talking about everything. It formulates in your brain for ages first. It's not just a, I'm going to stop. You can't do it that way. And that's also like in the film, uh, that's what it tries to show because it's another side of the film that, that I want to, exposed that isn't really talked about and it is when you're at when you're that far gone in alcoholism you can't just stop yeah um and it's already like a physical sickness yeah because there's five stages of addiction and when you're in the ad- addicted stage your body needs it you but you can't you cannot so there's a point where he tries to stop and um and then he has psychosis and so that's another thing that uh, and that scene is actually almost verbatim what my dad said about me when I was in London. Um, and that's another thing that's not not talked about is alcoholic psychosis. When you are that bad because your liver is no longer functioning, you're that close now to death. It's, you're, you're close to multi-organ failure. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's something that I don't think is ever, I don't think I've ever seen it anywhere in a film before. So it is also happy. <laughs> it's also hope in the film as well. But I wanted to show the raw reality of the situation, yeah. you know. Because it is stark when it gets that, like, don't get that bad, essentially, you know, if you can. Have you thought about, like, so basically you had a feature uh, length script for it, right? Uh, I had a TV pilot length script, a 57 page script, which I'd, I'll have to go back to it sometime and look at. Um, but have you thought about maybe making it a feature? Because it's like, it feels like the story uh could be very interesting it also has like as i understand like there is kind of interaction between like the 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 older guy and the young guy so kind of like we've seen something similar in like in 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 films but not maybe with this topic yeah it's something that i'm toying with there's still i've got another 
I'm not, I feel like I'm not quite done on this topic. I'm still writing other topics as well at the moment, mm-hmm. but I feel like I'm not quite done on this topic. And I'm toying with how I want to, what avenue I want to go down. Like, do I want it to be more of a, like an anthology sort of series mm-hmm. or do I want it to be a film? I'm not sure because I want to show... Because the ten, you know, if it's like the red thread is is his, is his addiction or her addiction, if it was to change, but um, and it's the tentacles of how that affects all other people um, that really interests me. Because I think it's we don't ever really see stories of how it affects the others. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is something that I'm, yeah, I'm. I'm st- that's one that's still mulling, still working its way through. I'd love you to do more. Well, and so I've written another. I'm on my, just about to start my fifth draft of another short and uh, my second draft, I'm also one of these writers who just doesn't do one thing at once. I don't mm. know if you've noticed that from everything that I've said already, but um, the, yeah, my second draft of another one. So there's still definitely, there's definitely more coming um, and I'm hopefully producing a short um, with the girl who played B. Um but, you know, we're, we're in very early stages of that. Yeah, we're going to see if we can get funding and things for that. And uh, so there's definitely more coming. Definitely more. more. There's, I'm full of ideas at the moment. It's just funding at the moment is the issue. Uh, so, yes. So I want to apply for some funding for the one short. It's a, it's a dance thing, uh, short film. It's about a girl who's uh, just at the last stages of her dance career who finally gets her the pinnacle role that she she wants, but will an unexpected pregnancy derail her and give it to her younger rival? Mm. And there's a few twists and turns in it. And then there's the other one, which is um, Natasha's. So I'm going to apply for funding for both of those. So in these next few weeks, I'm working on my production packs and budgets and, and whatnots for those to nice. hopefully apply for funding too. It's amazing. I always love to hear from people who I talk to on the podcast that they're doing something. <laughs> yes. Well, this is the thing. And, and they've also potentially i don't know when but got a documentary in the, the works i've got a producer for that too so yes my thing is is i want to do all the things all the time all at once mm. so i need to just let really in a little bit but yeah there's definitely more coming so what would be your advice for people who want to start filming writing doing acting mm. let's start with acting okay acting is i would say learn learn how to act it's not a case of just getting up and walking and talking and speaking um do you know there's a bbc writers room's got all of the scripts get some of the scripts work on it at home practice practice learning practice doing a character practice doing the opposite of the character the way that you've seen it you know have a go practice do you think like for for people who haven't done any acting and just thinking about it do you think it's worth starting doing it at home or like it's better to find class like well if you can if you're in if you're in a part of the country where you're lucky enough lucky enough to have classes Mm -hmm. or you can have online classes then do um if you're not you can just do it at home still you know there is no you don't have there's no there doesn't have to be a barrier um and yeah and try it out and then thankfully there are thousands of classes at the moment that are online Mm -hmm. so test it see try experiment also think that class is the best way to learn you don't have to get it right in class you experiment and you try in class mm-hmm. um so you might not want to go with a top casting director and do that as a class mm-hmm. you know <laughs> you might want to do an actual drama class um so i would say do that i'd say practice learn go and watch tv theater film whatever you can watch absorb it all listen to podcasts about how other people do it read books about how other people do it you know you need to and then it's a business find out what's happening in the industry mm-hmm. you need to if you really want to be in it, you need to be in it. Yeah. Nice. And for writing, I guess same. the same. <laughs> exactly the same. Writing, by the way, is one of the things that is free. Yes. I mean, you if you already have a device, any device, even well, writing on the phone probably is not, but some people actually write on the phone faster than I'm on a keyboard. Yeah. Or, you know, just write in a note, but like start writing. Right? Yeah, exactly. And then also write, write parts for yourself. Read it out. Yeah, exactly. Oh, by the way, yeah, reading out, like, yeah. if you wrote something and then you read it out loud, out loud for sure. Out loud, always out loud. You will hear the problems straight away. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's also another thing with acting. Pick up a novel, read it out loud. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then, well, basically making your, I think that's a bit harder. Making your yeah. own film, directing 
producing. Yeah, so I would say, okay, obviously, like, I've, you know, I've gone a bit extra in doing my first ever film as a 22-minute drone shot big thing. You don't have to do that. <laughs> don't do that. Don't be me. Um, you've got a smartphone. You've got a camera there all the time. You know, just get a couple of mates. Practice. Just just have a go. Mm-hmm. You know, have a go. Edit stuff. You can do it on your phone even. You can edit things on your phone. And also, there's so many things on Instagram and um, TikTok and X, keep wanting to call it Twitter, <laughs> about how to make films, how to make short films. Learn, watch films and see what is it that I like about them. And loads of brilliant podcasts as well. So, yeah. 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 And I got to say, like, now we're doing this podcast. There is so much stuff on YouTube that is amazing yeah. and free. And you just like even even simple color, color grading, editing, like everything. There is so much tutorials. So yeah, just start. I think that, I think it's a class, you know, if you want to do it, you've got to learn it. Mm. You've got to learn. You do have to take the time to learn. Mm. There's a bit of a thing now where people just want to know like that, don't they? I think, I think, uh, I thought about it, you know, like people a lot throw this word talent around. Mm-hmm. Which I don't think we actually know what it means because I don't think that talent is not something measurable. Like, like uh, in most of the cases, because I think that talent is when you're really enjoying the process of doing and learning, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and also growing. I think it's growing as well. Like you know, you don't get to be a painter in the the national gallery if you only pick up a paintbrush every once a year. Yes. It's a, it's a must, and it's also a muscle memory. And also, the thing is, is I always question like, if you don't want to do it all the time, then do you really enjoy it? Yeah. Is it really what you want? What is the reason you're saying you want it if you don't want to do all of that work? Yeah, yeah. And when you say like you want a result, like what kind of result? Like what result do you want? Yeah. What do you see as a result? Because I think a lot of people think have this like misconception of success in acting, for example. Mm-hmm. What is success? Some people think that success is acting is being on the red carpet, which is nice, of course. I, I understand that, but I think for me, success in acting is. Being able to act all the time and support yourself. Yes. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. But doing acting, just yeah. acting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. What's next for you? We've got Romania filming uh, for The Inside Man. Um, these two shorts in the documentary. Three shorts in the documentary. Um, and then hopefully some more acting and voiceover work. I mean, that's so uncertain, isn't it? So, <laughs> God knows when that's going to happen. But hopefully that will also happen during that. But I know the things, again, going back to what you can control, I can control when my two shorts are made that I've written. So they're and the documentary. Okay, look, the only thing that we have left right now mm-hmm. is a blitz round. Okay. And uh, there is, like just so you know, yeah. no right or wrong answers, okay. no prizes, no point of doing it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Texting or talking? Talking. Oh, it depends. I'd say generally talking. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Cats or dogs? Dogs. Okay. Your one guilty pleasure? Oh, well, I've got a lot. That's really tough. <laughs> 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 I'll tell you my most embarrassing is um, there's a yodeler called Mary Schneider who's just brilliant to Hooper too. There mm. you go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, what makes you laugh? Uh, loads of things. I laugh all the time. I think it's the most important thing in life. Yeah. Okay, then what makes you, makes you angry? Oh, what makes me angry? Um, ignorance. I think, yeah, definitely. People being ignorant and slow walkers. Move over to the side of the pavement. Uh, do you have any nicknames? Uh, yes, Cat, obviously. Um, Katie, but that's strictly for my family. And uh, some of my friends call me G because of Georgia. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what dish do you cook best? Probably, it's definitely Southeast Asian. Maybe pho. I love Southeast Asian foods. It's like, and I love cooking, by the way. Love it. I used to have a, a, an Instagram channel called Cat Cooks Dinner. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> it was successful? <laughs> uh, it was during COVID and then I decided to do acting, so uh. we kind of just stopped. <laughs> uh, your favourite character in any fictional story, like book, video, game, I don't know, uh, film, series, cartoons? Favourite? Gosh, that's hard. Oh, because I love... Oh, you see that? I don't really have a favourite in anything. I'm going to just go for the one that pops into my head, Lady Macbeth. I love her. She's so, like, flawed and troubled and feisty. Star Wars or the Lord of the Rings? Lord of the Rings. Yes. Love the Lord of the Rings. Devoured the books. Yeah. Uh, do you have any unknown and expected talents? 
No, I don't think so. All right. How often do you cry? Most recently was when Jim shouted action on one of our scenes. <laughs> <laughs> That's for the character. It's nothing okay. to do with Jim. Nice. Um, I don't know. It depends. Um, I'm not. I don't. I'm not a big crier, but obviously doing Changing Tides has made me cry m- more yeah. recently. I would All say. right. Yeah. I hope it was kind of cleansing cry. No, it was a cleansing cry. Yeah, it was definitely a cleansing cry. Uh, how can people reach you if they want to work with you? Social media is the best. I would say if you want to reach me personally, then it's um, on Instagram and Facebook. I'm Catherine Giorgio, which is difficult to spell both. So on uh, Twitter, I'm KG Actress, a lot easier. Um, and if it's my production company, then it's This Is House of Tales. Nice. And finally, I asked you yesterday or a couple of days ago to prepare one cool thing. Mm-hmm. As I said, the segment that I borrowed from script notes, something that you like and you think our viewers or listeners will like to. Film festivals. It's got to be film festivals. I think the film festivals... All of them? <laughs> yeah, no, we'll go to them. You don't have to be part of it. Like I've been going to film festivals for years on my own, sort of just like getting a lay of the land, understanding networking, finding out different things. If you want to be in this profession in any shape or form, then film festivals, you get to see all of these up, up and coming independent filmmakers, brilliant films, they're such a good learning ground. And everyone on the indie circuit is so welcoming, they're so willing to connect and chat and Because everyone wants to work. Everyone wants to work and they want to work together. You see, yeah. that's the other thing is, you know, um, there's an, another podcast that always says, send the lift down, send the lift back down. If you've gone up to the top, send it back down. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's why film festivals are so wonderful. Like I've, when I've watched films that I really like about films, this was even before I was making my own, I would message them and ask them if I could meet them for a coffee. And 97% would say yes. Yeah. Um, So you're learning, you learn from each other, you're learning, you're growing, you're watching amazing things. And then you never know, maybe one day you'll go, oh, maybe I'll make a film. Mm. I feel like I know enough about it now. So I think it just removes some of that velvet curtain. So I would say film festival, and it's so important to support indie film. It's true. Look, I'm sure there were a couple of questions more that I had. And I can think of one already right now that I forgot to ask you is about theater, but well, let's, let's do this. In your time, your time or something like that, when you have another short film come out or like you have more uh, stuff that we can talk about, mm-hmm. we'll do another one of those and we'll talk about those things as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for being so open, uh, so, so welcoming. And um, it was great. Thank you. I loved it. Yeah, it's good. You, if you liked it, like and subscribe or don't. <laughs> No, hit that like button. <laughs> yes, yes, please do. Thank you very much. Bye, guys. Bye.